The name of the game is speed. The best tool is the one that you can use quickly without thinking about how to get what's in your head into the real world. The latest version of Substance Designer adds an amazing new feature to its arsenal where you can add shortcuts as hotkeys to add nodes into the graph editor. Today I'm going to show you how to add hotkeys and assign them to any node in Substance Designer. Along the way, we're going to create this rocky footpath texture, which should demonstrate how customizing the program in this way should give you speed. All right, so to set up your shortcuts, go to Edit, Preferences, and then click shortcuts here and you'll see all of your shortcuts and notes here listed in this view. So I've got some already set up here and what Substance is showing you in this list by default are what they call the atomic nodes. And these are the nodes that show up at the top of your graph. They would show up when you press spacebar or tab on the graph editor. And you can assign different shortcuts for the different types of graphs that Substance Designer has to offer. So for the function graph that we talked about a little bit in my function tutorial, there's the FX map graph and the MDL graph as well. We're just going to stick with the compositing graph for now because that's what we use to make most of our materials. So if you'd like to assign a shortcut to a node that's not listed here, go to the search bar and let's say we'll type in something like slope for slope blur grayscale. And to assign a shortcut, I'm going to click here. And for this one, I'm going to use shift and S and hit apply. Now, if you'd like to see all of the nodes that you've applied shortcuts to, click show all assigned. And this is how I have it currently set up for now. You see, I have some that are just letters by themselves. Some have the shift key. So this is how I have my setup right now, but I'm also thinking about maybe using the number pad or using the function keys at the top, but this is what I'm working with for now. So I've got our shortcut set up. I'm going to hit OK. And now check this out. If I hit B, I've got a blend node or T for transform 2D. And if I hit spacebar, you can see that my shortcuts are popping up here for my atomic nodes. Same thing if I type slope blur grayscale, it'll show up here. So you can see how this could save you a bunch of time if you're going through node by node. You no longer have to press spacebar and type in slope blur grayscale and hit that. You can now hit shift S or whatever you've assigned it to. The same thing happens when you select a node and hit your key. It'll automatically connect it like it normally would. And you can see how this could speed up your workflow quite a bit. Okay, so now that we have our shortcuts assigned, let's use them to create some sort of rocky road kind of texture. So I'm going to start off with a tile sampler. You see I have a shortcut already made for that and it was quick and easy. So I'm going to click on the tile sampler. I'm going to change the pattern to disk. I'm going to decrease the amount it's tiling this shape. Uh, it doesn't have to be uniform, but I'm going to keep it relatively low. I'm going to go down to my position random and I'm going to really scatter these about, change the offset, and I'm going to bring the scale down quite a bit. The goal that I have right now is to make sure that none of these disks are touching each other. So that's looking good for now. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a distance node. You see I have a shortcut for that one. I'm going to select my tile sampler and hit my shortcut for the levels node. And I'm going to drag this in to my distance node. Now nothing is really supposed to happen yet. We still need to do some setup. So I'm going to go to my tile sampler. I'm going to scroll down to the bottom under the color settings and I'm going to choose color random. And what that's going to do, if I double click my tile sampler, it's going to assign a random grayscale value to these tiles. So for my tile sampler, I'm going to drag its output into the second input in my distance node. And I'm going to go to my levels and I'm going to drag this all the way to the left. And what that's going to do is that that's actually going to get rid of all of those luminance values that I just made. You see, I do that here. And the reason why I'm doing that is because the distance node needs two inputs. It needs a mask input, which is black and white, and it needs a source input, which can be multiple grayscale values. So my levels, now that it's been dragged all the way to the left here, is creating a simple black and white mask image. Now, if I double click my distance node to see what we're doing, I'm going to increase the maximum distance. Now, if I drag this all the way to the right, you can still see some grayscale values here, but you can see what it's doing. It's finding the nearest point 
and creating this Voronoi pattern here. If I drag it all the way to the right, it doesn't quite fill it in completely. You can still see some grayscale values. So I'm going to type in a large number, say 999. And now we have plain, flat, full grayscale values for all of these cells that have been created. So the distance node is really good at creating this type of pattern if we have a tile sampler attached to it by creating all these different cells or points, which can then grow and create this pattern using the distance node. Next up, I'm going to select the distance node and add an edge detect. This is going to detect all the edges between these different grayscale cells. So we look at our edge detect here. We can adjust our width and the roundness of these cells that we've created here. I think I'm going to choose something more like that. Actually, that looks good. Up next, I'm going to add a flood fill node. So a quick tip. I didn't choose the F key for flood fill because what it does is frames up what you currently have by default. So if you select some nodes and hit F, it frames it up for you. Pretty useful. I decided to use Shift F for my assigned flood fill shortcut. So I'm going to select my edge detect output and put it into the flood fill. And the flood fill takes these black and white islands that we've created here using the edge detect and allows me to apply different flood fill nodes to them so that I can randomize some certain effects based on all these different shapes. So with my flood fill selected, I'm going to add the flood fill to gradient node, and I'm going to apply a bunch of angle variation with this slider. So you can see that now all of my islands here that I've created have different gradients assigned to them. And we're actually going to do this a couple times here, and I'll explain why in a second. So I'm going to copy and paste this flood fill to gradient. And when I do that, it keeps the flood fill input here that we've already attached. So what I'm going to do now then is instead of changing this angle variation myself or using this angle widget, which is completely possible if you want to do it yourself, I'm going to use this random seed slider. You can apply the random seed to an entire graph or just a particular node, and it will filter down through all of its properties. So the angle variation property is based on this random seed. So I'm going to slide it to the right once to bring it to one. And now you can see we have different gradients here. So here's the first one. Here's the second one. Let's do the same thing. Copy and paste it. Change the random seed. And I'm going to do it one more time. Copy and paste. Change the random seed. So we have zero. Let's change this to one, two, and let's make this three. So now we have different gradients based on different random seeds. Now we want to blend them together. So I'm going to select my flood fill to gradient at the top here and hit my hotkey for blend. I'm going to drag in the second one into the foreground and change the blend mode to min darken. I'm going to do the same thing here. Now I'm going to hit this blend, hit my hotkey, attach the third one to the foreground and min darken. I'm going to do the same thing for the last one into the foreground, min darken. So now in our 2D view, you can see that we've got these different planes here. And let's preview what we're doing in our 3D view to really see what's going on. So I've got my outputs here all set up because I'm using the physically based metal roughness template. And I'm going to make a new blend node and attach it to these outputs here. So I'm going to attach the output of this new blend node into the normal. I'm going to delete this uniform color attached to my ambient occlusion node and add my ambient occlusion node here and connect it up. Then drag this blend and also attach it to the ambient occlusion. I'm also going to attach this blend to the height and delete that default uniform color. And finally, connect our final blend here at the end of our graph to the foreground of this blend. And let's make some room here so you can see what's going on. So this is what we have so far. Our islands have been divided up into multiple planes, as you can see here, based on these different gradients that we've created. And you can see how that translates to these rocks that you can now see in the 3D view. So next up, I want to soften these shapes a little bit because you can see we're getting quite a bit of tearing in our tessellation here. 
So to do that, let's make some room. I'm gonna drag all of my nodes and bring them over. Then I'm gonna select this last blend that we have, the, the blend that goes before the final blend that gets distributed to our output nodes. I'm gonna select this one here, and I'm gonna add our slope blur grayscale using the hotkey that we just created earlier. And I'm gonna slope it by, you see that it's been automatically inputted into the grayscale input for our slope blur grayscale. But let's define a slope. I'm going to deselect all of our nodes and I'm gonna use the hotkey I have for a blur high quality grayscale and assign our blend into the blur. And then gonna assign the output of the blur high quality into our slope blur grayscale. So we've definitely changed how our material looks quite a bit. So if we double click our slope blur grayscale, let's increase the samples and let's decrease the intensity to see what we're doing here. This is what it looked like before. And now if we slightly increase it, you see we're rounding off our shapes a little bit, getting rid of that tearing, and we're creating a bit more of a natural looking rock. And you can increase or decrease this to your liking, depending on how packed you want these rocks to be together in this path texture that we're making. I'm actually not gonna make them too close together because I wanna do one more thing to my shapes. If we go back in our graph, you see we have these flood filled a gradient nodes that we've created in succession. I'm gonna adjust them a little bit by using one more node. So I'm gonna make some more room by taking all of these blends and our slope blur and our high quality blur and moving them over. And I'm gonna select the connection that comes right after my first flood fill to gradient node. And I'm gonna hit the hotkey that I have for a gradient map. And because it's yelling at me, I'm now gonna switch it to grayscale. And I'm gonna adjust these keys a little bit. And I'm gonna double click on this gradient map so you can see what's going on in the 2D viewport. Let's zoom in a little bit. If I select the gradient, I can alter the keys and I can remap the intensity of this particular gradient map. And if I really adjust it here and adjust the bottom, we're cutting away at our rocks in a, a realistic kind of manner here. And we can really shape what these rocks look like. So let's do the same thing to our second flood filter gradient. I'm gonna hit my hotkey, add a gradient map, switch it to grayscale. You can add a key in and shape it this way too. Very interesting. And to see things a little bit better, I'm going to go to my scene and change it to a rounded cylinder. And I'm gonna hit Control, Shift, and right click to change my light source. See what we're getting. I'm also going to go to my outputs click on my ambient occlusion node and increase the height depth so we can really see what's going on here with this ambient occlusion and see what's going on with these rocks. All right, so let's go, let's pick this last one here and let's do the same thing we've been doing. I'm gonna add my gradient map with my hotkey, choose grayscale, select the gradient and play with these values a little bit. Looking good. Because we're darkening this blend every single time, it's kind of a good practice to level things out again. So after our slope blur grayscale, I'm gonna add an auto levels. And this kind of brings everything back to the black to white ratio that our height map is used to dealing with. So things are normalized a bit more. So for one last detail, I'm gonna add some natural looking divots into these rocks. I'm gonna do that with another tile sampler node. So with this tile sampler, I'm gonna set it to paraboloid. I'm gonna decrease the X and Y amount a little bit, but I'm still gonna have quite a bit. I'm also gonna add scale, scale random, and quite a bit of position random. And I'm going to increase the scale quite a bit. So you can see we're creating these cracks as well as these sphere-like gradients. And what I'm gonna do is after our auto levels, this is the this is our final height map that we have so far. After this auto levels, 
I'm going to add another blend node with my hotkey, and then I'm going to take the output of my tile sampler and put it into the foreground of the blend node. And I'm going to set the blending mode to subtract. Now you can see everything's pretty much disappeared. Let's quickly dial up down this opacity. You can see what we're getting here. This is what it looks like without it. And if we add just a tiny bit of this new tile sampler set to subtraction, we're getting a lot more of these divots and these details. And if we're not quite happy with how it looks, we can go to our tile sampler and we can adjust these properties. So I can go to my position random. You can see I can dial in exactly what kind of look I'm going for with these rocks. I can adjust the size random, the scale, And we're really creating a stylized looking patch of rocks here. If I go to my scene and change it back to a plain high res, you can see what's going on with our patch of rocks. Okay, so you've seen the process where we create these rocky base shapes for your texture. Now, let's do it again, but at a quicker pace, so I can show you how adding these shortcuts really saves you a bunch of time. So let's quickly recreate what we just did. I'm gonna add a tile sampler and change the pattern to disc. I'm gonna adjust the X and Y amount, bring down the scale, we randomize it a little bit and adjust the position random. Bring that scale down. I'm gonna quickly add a levels and distance node, hook them up correctly. I always forget to change the color random on my tile sampler here and bring the levels. So we're creating that mask. Bring up the distance, then add an edge detect. So adjust the roundness and the edge width and apply a flood fill. Then a flood fill to gradient. And let's make a couple of these. So we're gonna apply angle variation. I forgot to do it to this one too. And let's adjust the random C to one. We'll do two. And three. Now let's blend these together. Blend node, set this to min darken. Paste, gonna set that as the background. This one is the foreground. Copy and paste it again. Background, foreground. And that's already on min darken. Great. Then to preview what's going on, I'm just going to bring up my blend here that's going into my outputs and just bring that in here to see what we're doing so far. See, we're creating a very different looking variation, but it's still looking like rocks here. All right, let's make some room. Let's adjust these rocks a little bit by adding in our gradient maps. So I'm going to select this one, add a gradient map, set to grayscale bring in some of these edges here. Same thing with this one. Let's do this one this time. And to our final blend, We'll add our slope blur and our high quality blur. Crank up the samples, bring down the intensity, and let's adjust this blur, see what kind of slope blur we're gonna get. Maybe 
maybe not so much for this patch. And you can see we now have another patch of rocks here. So if we take a look at our original, that's one group of rocks. And use a different patch. And now as an added bonus, why don't we add these two together? So let's make some room. And what I'd like to do is I've got our new rocks selected here, but I want to make a bunch more. I want to turn these into pebbles. So I'm going to go all the way back to our tile sampler. And because Substance Designer is procedural, we can do this. So let's bring up the X and Y amount much higher. You can see they're going to start disappearing. That's because of our edge detect. If the edge roundness and the edge width are too much, it gets rid of these shapes from our distance node. So if we double click our edge detect and bring down our edge roundness, you can see a bunch of our rocks are coming back. Let's change the edge width as well. Bring that down. We're now getting a bunch of these smaller pointier rocks. We can adjust the roundness. This can also mask off rocks if you'd like them to. I'm just going to bring in a bunch more. But next what I want to do is go to the end of both of our rock formations that we've created here. And I'm going to add a height blend node. And this is a really powerful and extremely useful node here. So it asks for two inputs here, a height top and a height bottom as well as a mask. So on the top, I want my big rocks. So let's put the big rocks on the height top. Let's get the smaller rocks. Let's put them on the bottom. And let's take the blended height output and bring it into our, bring it into our blend that's connected to all of our outputs here. You can see what it does by default. But let's adjust the parameters of our height blend a little bit. So a single click the height blend and let's adjust this height offset so you can see our big rocks are going beneath the small ones but if I bring the height offset up now our smaller rocks are sinking into the bottom and so now I've got a much more detailed texture here which seems to be tiling pretty well and here we go, we've got some small rocks underneath our large ones. Now, remember that random seed I was talking about? If I double click the graph here with nothing selected and change random seed here, you can get a completely different rock pattern just by changing this random seed, which adjusts all of these other nodes that are being affected by that random seed parameter. So you can really generate an art direct in a way your substances. And let's also look at this on the rounded cylinder. And these are some base shapes that you can really detail and create some awesome footpath, or rock path textures for your renders. I hope this video has given you a glimpse at what shortcuts can do for you, as well as started your rock making journey in Substance Designer. Now it seems like rocks have their own category in the texture creation YouTube video space. So if you're interested in more rock tips and tricks, leave a comment down below that like button and let me know what you'd like to learn. Also, a couple days ago, I did my first live stream and I'm planning on doing my next one later on this week. So if you're interested in hanging out and learning some texture making and substance designer, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell to be notified. I'm Jeremy Siner and that's it for this video. I'll see you in the next one.